Tēnā koutou, katoa. Welcome everybody, ladies and gentlemen, book lovers and food lovers, to an evening with Nigella Lawson. My name is Rachel King, I'm the Programme Director of Word Christchurch. It's my great pleasure to welcome our regular event attendees and all our first timers. For those of you who don't know us, Word Christchurch stages year-round events from the small, such as children's workshops and school events, to hosting events with visiting authors, such as Alexander McCall Smith, Ian Rankin and David Williams, all past guests, right up to superstar events such as this one. The jewel in our crown is the biennial Word Christchurch Writers and Readers Festival, which takes place this year from the 29th of August to the 2nd of September, a whopping 75 events over four days, engaging all sectors of the community and all aspects of words and books. It's a festival of world-changing ideas and storytelling to inform, entertain and inspire you. So keep an eye out for details of more events to come, big and small. We thank the Christchurch City Council, Creative New Zealand and the Router Foundation for their support. As a charitable trust, we rely on the generosity of our funders and supporters to keep ticket prices affordable and our events accessible. Particular thanks tonight go to Nigella Lawson's publisher, Penguin Random House, for bringing her to us. Nigella Lawson. The name inspires awe, but she also inspires us to love food and to love cooking. Her 1998 book, How to Eat, has been a staple in my house for 20 years. Before Nigella Bites, I had no idea that TV shows about cooking could be so mesmerising, informative and inspiring. Who among us didn't envy the colourful bookcases that lined the dining room where she shared her food with friends and family? And who among us didn't fall in love with her just a little bit when she stood at midnight in her robe at the open fridge door <laughs> nibbling on pork fat? <laughs> we thought, here is a woman who understands the pleasure of food. Here is a woman who understands me. After all, when asked in an interview once about the secret to her glowing complexion, she replied, I'm a great believer in fat. My view is that you moisturise from the inside. <laughs> this is an important lesson for us all. Tonight your host is novelist, journalist and foodie Nikki Pellegrino. Nikki will introduce Nigella properly, they'll have a conversation for about an hour, then we'll have time to take some questions from the audience. Be aware that you'll have to make your way to microphones for these questions on each level, at the front of each level on the sides, here, here and here. Um, so if you're in the middle of the row, I'm very sorry, but you're at a disadvantage. Um, afterwards, Nigella will be signing books, which can be purchased at the university bookshop stand in the foyer, or you may have brought your own. Now, without further ado, enjoy your evening with Nigella Lawson, and please welcome your host for tonight, Nikki Pellegrino. I love it. Um, I'm not going to bang on for hours because I know you're all here to hear Nigella, not me, so I'm going to do a really short intro, okay? We all know who Nigella is. She exploded on the scene 20 years ago with How to Eat, which was a cookbook not like any other. It was very narrative in style. I don't think it's got a single food picture in it. It's certainly not Instagram worthy, and yet it was a massive success. A year later, she did her first TV series, Nigella Bites, and I watched a bit of that at home yesterday, and um, she's still the same. It's really interesting. She has her, her, her mannerisms, the way she speaks, the way she cooks. She hasn't really changed. She's still bringing us the kind of food that answers that perennial question everyone asks every day, what will we have for dinner? Her food isn't tricksy. Because when she started as a food writer, she was actually a journalist and a mum. She wasn't a chef, so she doesn't do fancy schmancy drizzles all over the plates. She's not thinking about how it's going to play out on Instagram. Um, her latest book, At My Table, has got some really interesting recipes in it, including a chicken fricasse that she says in her intro has a face that only a mother could love. <laughs> um, but she... she this book in particular, it's just a loose collection of the things she cooks, and she expects us to take them home, learn to cook them, and then maybe 
put our own little spin on them. We, we don't have to obey her instructions 100%. We can make the recipes our own. And I think that's why we love her so much. So I'm pretty confident that this book, if you buy it, is destined to live in your kitchen and get completely splattered with food. And you're going to eat the tray baked chicken on frozen peas. You might even try the egg curry. I was a bit dubious about that to begin with, but whoever, you know, you might. So we've got a whole hour, and I hope we're going to find out some things, interesting things about Nigella tonight. I'm pretty sure we are. So without further ado, I'm going to invite her on stage, Nigella Lawson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Lovely to see you all. Lots of you. I'll be mother. Start with a bit of a fun fact because for this book, Nigella didn't just make the food, she contributed creatively in another area, didn't you? Well, creatively is up for question, but I, I made some of the bowls. So, um, for quite a long time, I've harbored this belief that I was really a potter and um, I really wanted that maybe that's. That was something in my future, and I really wanted to do it. Everyone always said to me that, uh, the, 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 the potters have said to me, it's like cooking, it's being on the wheel, and it's like baking, it's like making bread. And I, can I just say, they are so wrong. Um, it's, you really struggle on a pottery wheel. I really struggled. And when it goes wrong, you're just left with a lump of clay. You know, when a recipe doesn't go right, you generally can still eat it. Um, but I went, I went with some, I should say, I went with some friends of mine. We call ourselves the Potterati. Among our number are um, the fabulous, uh, well, what do we see quite a chef? He is a chef and food writer, Yotam Otolenghi, and also a very, very dear friend of mine, um, extraordinary great chef and gorgeous man, your very own Peter Gordon. Oh. Um, Peter's really annoyingly talented at it. <laughs> um, he only joined us for the last time and he's better than everyone else, although Yotam doesn't quite think so. Um, but we all go off together and also uh, the, my book's designer and a uh, wonderful art and also an artist, her partner an artist and a friend of mine who's a documentary filmmaker. I am the worst without any doubt. I mean, they all have, they're all much more talented, but we have fun. Um, what's very good about having both Yotam and Peter there is they get competitive about who's gonna set up the best bar. And um, so we have, we bring little snacks just in case we're hungry ever, little snacks, um, drinks, um, and we go for walks and we do our pottery. We, do, we take over this class privately and we have a wonderful time. My, I'm not very good at the pottery, but, but I do enjoy their company. And it's, there is, you know, it, it's quite, there's something rather lovely about trying to make something by hand. Yes, saying. this is, I made this dish. So this is after I gave up the wheel um, and I found a bit, of, a bit of plastic netting and I, rolled out some clay and I pressed the plastic netting on it to make the thing and then for some reason decided to glaze it that colour. Um, I think this is very on trend now. This well, is sort of organic. It is, but when you, the, the thing about them, when you touch them, they are a bit clunky and heavy. But then I am not a delicate person. Well, I did think that when I heard that you'd taken up pottery, because aren't you famously quite clumsy? Very. <laughs> I am, I am clumsy, and I'm not, I, that's why I couldn't do the well, I can't, I'm not good with my hands, and it's, people find that odd, because what I, well, they don't find it that odd, they've seen me on television, but it's, um, but the thing is, I, it's, when people say, but that's ridiculous, you know, you must be, because you cook, and I always think, well, do you really think that everyone who cooks is good with their hands? And you don't have to be, you know, that, that you, I think you have to have a palate, and you have to trust your palate. And I think you have to have curiosity to work out what tastes good and, and how, and pay attention, actually. Pay attention in a small way to what happens when you add certain ingredients. But what you don't have to be 
is, um, as it were, nimble with your fingers, uh, unless you want to do, you know, very, very uh, delicate lattice work um, with pastry or, you know, sugar, doing work with sugar. Well, I can't do that, but I don't think it matters. You know, I, I like a pie to look a bit ramshackle. I don't need it to look like it's someone's got, you know, the crochet hook and it all looks perfect. But you, know, you never know, one day I might be desperate to do that. You should never rule anything out in life. <laughs> now, in the intro to your book, Feast, you write the following sentence. When we go into a kitchen, we're both creating and responding to an idea we hold about ourselves, what kind of person we are or wish to be. How we eat and what we eat lies at the heart of who we are. So given that this book is a collection of recipes mm. and how you cook and how you eat, what does that say about you, who you are? Well, I think it, well, I think it clearly says I'm quite greedy. Um, I think, I think it, it shows I'm quite eclectic in my likes. Um, fair, I, that I, I, think, I think really... That I haven't, I mean, I have a need to feed people, clearly. You know, my friends always joke that if someone comes to, you know, mend the boiler, um, they'll be leaving with something wrapped in tin foil. Um, but I do, that I think, I'm, I don't know, because in a way, I don't know if any of us truly knows who we are. I know that that's very fashionable to think of it, but I think the self is not... Um, single strand and every time we try and think of one thing about ourselves we can probably think of something that counteracts that but I still feel I'm in the process of working out when I cook and I think that there, there is something you are making a discovery each time and I like that and I think that's for me fun enough you know as I say I try pottery and I am clumsy for me there's I I was where I was brought up I was brought up to in a way, to be slightly ashamed of my clumsiness, because, you know, in families, there's, those things go on. And yet, when I cook, I feel, well, actually, yes, I am clumsy, and I do knock things over constantly as I cook. I mean... Do you burn yourself and cut yourself? And all the time. Um, but I still feel that, you know, actually, that doesn't mean you can't be competent. You can get things. You know, I, I am... It is, and it is an act of... I do feel it's a creative act, cooking. Um, I don't believe it's an art, but I think it's a creative act when you, when you cook, and I love that feeling. And that gives me a very quiet sense of... I'd say achievement is the wrong thing to say. It's not achievement, and it's not accomplishment. I just think... Yes, but it's more a, it's more a feeling of um, attainment, but in, a, in quite a... As I say, in, in not an artistic, exaggerated way, it's a quiet feeling uh, of that I've done something, and I like that. I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I'm naturally an enormously calm person, so I, I like if I can rest that feeling from any everyday activity, I'm thrilled. So cooking brings you calm, do you think? Yes. But I think that cooking can only bring you calm when you're not being judged on it and when you're not having to, do, you know, do sort of culinary tap dancing. Yeah. Um, you know, when I, it's often just a normal family meal, or I have to say I rather love cooking for myself as well. Um, I think it's something that people should be encouraged to do. So if you were going to have a night in on your own, what would you make for yourself? What would be your sort of indulgent treat well it's, well it's if I had a night in, do you know what I'd slightly fantasize about this because I haven't been in my kitchen for a long time I have I don't think I'm capable of starting off with a with, with a small amount of cooking so I'd have to start off with something family sized and then know that I had the leftovers for a week um, I think <laughs> So I'm going to be in London on Tuesday, and I'm afraid that what I, was, what I was doing before I left to come here today was putting in an order in the, the online supermarket for <laughs> what it's going to deliver. And um, I fear I've got to go back later and take a lot of things off it, because I'm so overexcited. <laughs> I think I've bought far too much. I've bought some organic minced beef. I've bought an organic chicken. 
every single bit of leafy greens that are in season in Britain at the moment, surprisingly quite a lot, and um, some Brussels sprouts, which I can't wait to have. Um, I bought two sorts of potato, three if you count sweet potatoes, and um, many mushrooms. I really am, uh, and, and some blood oranges and uh, some bergamot. I feel like I'm going to make myself some bergamot curd. But I really, so I really feel I've, I've got to, I need to be at home. I need a full fridge, and I need to know I'm going to start cooking. And so, it, so soups. So I'm going to make chicken first day. And vegetables, and then I've got stomachs, chicken broth the next day, because I've ordered some chicken wings as well as the chicken, so to help give a bit of oomph to my soup, a lot of leeks, and um, then only when I've, when that, when everything is, you know, when it smells of a lemony roasting chicken, um, when I'm, on the day I'm actually back, and then when I've got soup and stock in bowls in my fridge, will I feel safely, at, you know, that that's it, I can now live here. I can't believe you've just done your supermarket shopping from Christchurch. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. You talk about recipe books as being containers of memories, and in this book you refer to the blue formica table mm. of your childhood. So I wondered what the meals around that table were like, what your memories of those are. Well, one of the meals is something that I've written about in, in uh, Kitchen, my mother's praised chicken, which again, chicken central in my life. This is an awful thing to say, but someone once said on Twitter, you're the person that mother hens warn their chicks about when they're naughty. Um, so my mother used to do something, I call it my mother's praised chicken, which is chicken, it's quite old fashioned, I'm sure. It's chicken cooked in a pot with vegetables in liquid rather than being roast, although she did roast chicken a lot as well. And um, she would make that with an um, egg and lemon sauce with a bit of saffron and as well as having melted butter in it, so it's a bit like a holiday, but the saffron, she'd ladle in some of the chicken stock from the chicken and we'd have it with rice. So it's not a stew and it's, it's half a tin soup in a stew. And we had that. There was... Um, well, this egg mayonnaise, non-stop. We used to make mayonnaise at home. My mother used to get us to make mayonnaise from a very young age. You know, the proper was kind when you're whisking by hand. So there was a lot of things like egg mayonnaise and, um, you know, crisscrossed with anchovies. Uh, Were you an adventurous eater as a kid? No, I didn't. I, I, no, not, I was not an adventurous eater, but I didn't willingly eat anything at mealtimes. Really? Mm. Not until I was about... I don't know, 14, 13? Um, I mean, it, I liked a very strange things. So I loved spinach. I would eat spinach a lot, and um, spinach and hot chocolate were my two favorite <laughs> things. My grandmother always teased me that once we were in Brighton, and it was like a heat wave. It was something like, you know, 33 degrees, which is hot for us. And... Um, we went into a cafe and she thought, I've got to have a glass, you know, she had to have some water. And she said, what would you like? And I said, could I have some spinach and a hot chocolate, 33 degrees? But that is that I did love that. Funnily enough, I was quite adventurous when I was with my grandmother. So not at home. I didn't like all those stews. My mother's a good cook, but it was very much, you know, stews and that sort of thing. Um, so what changed? I don't know. I think being a bit more in charge of my own food. But I did like cooking with my grandmother. We used to go and cook things like we, we, um, brains in capers and brown butter. And I know, but you know what? I was so stupid, I didn't realize they were brains, <laughs> even though they were called brains. Um, I mean, you know, I was young, you know, six or something, but I mean, I had no idea. And then I thought, God, those are brains like in your head. <laughs> I mean, I saw them in my, in my mind. They were spelt B-R-A-N-E-S when I did the cooking. Uh, <laughs> But, but maybe that was just self-protective because well, they were rather wonderful and I still like them. I like them now in a very light batter and deep fried. Oh. <laughs> so do you don't like, so are you squeamish about food? I'm not an awful fan, no. Uh, no I am. I'm not an awful fan. Oh, that's interesting. So did, so did your grandmother teach you to cook, do you think? Was no, my mother did and because we had to cook. Yeah. But it... But my grandmother taught me to be interested in perhaps slightly different foods. I mean, my mother did cook. She did pasta because she was quite Mediterranean, lots of things, ratatouille. She then 
she went to Greece for holidays. My parents went to Greece for a while, and then when they came back, it was all Taramis, Salata, and Hummus, mm. and Moussaka. I remember that. That must have been in 72 or something, and I would have been 12. And that so was... that went, then that was all the time. That, and I did enjoy that. I liked watching her make things, and I liked helping and doing stuff. But I think I did find... Um, but maybe, you know, I'm not a particularly patient person and although I didn't like having people telling me what I had to do and what I had to eat I also think having seen now young children uh, you know various young children move through my house not just my own I do do think maybe I just didn't like that sitting down and be, having a, because in those days you were made, made to sit for a long time and I think maybe I just got impatient. Whereas with my grandmother, we were doing things and it didn't feel like that because uh, I come from a large family and then I suppose when I'm just her and me and we just played about in the kitchen. My mother also, we never had sweet things at home. Um, and, but she actually had a sweet tooth. So I would, uh, so I did teach myself to make, she loved old fashioned, almost like sort of English nursery puddings like um, jam roly-poly, which you would do in a tea towel and then steam. So I would do that and make that and make custard to, you know, to, to, as a treat for her. And then you went to university, you went to Oxford. Did you study Italian at Oxford? Well, I did, I did. I did medieval and modern languages, and then I did do Italian. I hadn't done it before, really, but I did. Yes, I did do Italian. But please don't suggest me. I know that you're half <laughs> Italian, but I don't know how good my... It would be a very short conversation okay. on my part. All oh, right. Um, so did you get into cooking at university? Were you... Yes. Yeah. I did cooking before, so I did... When I was, I was sent to boarding school and the food was so bad, it made me, it's, that's when the beginning, that's when I started really getting interested in it. And I'd read about food a lot and fantasize about what I would eat. And, uh, that, and so it made me much more interested in food. Yeah. Then um, I went to France when I was 16 to get my French better. I mean, not for very long. And um, I do remember everything I ate there and it was very interesting and going shopping it was it was I loved that went to Germany because I did German at school and although people are always mean about German food I adore it and um, I think northern European food actually is fascinating and um, and then I, I went to Italy and that did change everything and I did learn to cook a lot even though I didn't actually have a kitchen I was a chambermaid in a hotel and there were we weren't allowed in any of the private bits, but there was a couple who owned it, and they went to their farm outside of Florence um, in Arezzo, in fact, in the daytime sometimes, and the, the, the nonna, the grandmother of the house, the minute they were, they'd left, said, you know, come into the kitchen, and I used to watch her cook, and I think, uh, and I learned a lot from that, and I also um, didn't have much money, so I couldn't buy an awful lot, so it was a question of, you know, sometimes getting my priorities right, you know, that we'd, I was there with a school friend and supper would be a kilo of tomatoes and a bottle of wine. <laughs> this is a really awful thing I should say, is that when I went out to Italy, I bought, we, one of us bought a bottle of gin and one of us bought a bottle of vodka on duty-free, but we couldn't afford to buy tonic water. And so I used to have, I used to, we used to have drink gin in Aspro Clear because we'd come with medicine. <laughs> And not a lot. I'm not much of a drinker, but just, you know, a drink in the evening. That's dealing with the hangover. Yeah. yeah that's really... I don't know why we don't all do that, really. <laughs> yeah, we'll probably get into trouble for saying that. Um, <laughs> do, do you think Italy... Because Italy is the foodiest nation. Maybe I'm biased, but I Yeah, think I think it is. So did, do you think that did quite a lot to form your... It did everything. I, it did absolutely everything, because what I learnt about being in Italy is that you... You treat the food you're cooking with respect. I'm sure there are so many countries that do that, but I, that's where I was and that's what I learned. And I love the passion that everyone had for food. You, I mean, my, I learned Italian by discussing what everyone was eating. Everyone would sit and tell you and have a very firm view how something should be cooked, how it should be eaten, and uh, you know where you would get the best where you buy the best loaf of bread, where you would, uh, where the best cup of coffee was be had, you know, that it was, it was, it, it just felt like everyone was biting off every bit of the day and savoring it. It wasn't just about rushing through, this is, I'm getting this done and I'm getting that done. It really was about, it seemed about 
be about living. And um, I, I found that very inspiring. It, it gave me a, a path in a way. I, 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 even though I, I didn't think ever I'd write about food, I still, it made me think about food and enjoy cooking it in a different way. It's that passion, isn't it, that I think that everybody's got that. It's not a, spe it's not a special thing. And lack of pretension, because I think that unless you go to a very, uh, you know, I don't know, some big Michelin restaurant, generally speaking, the Italian ideal is really home-cooked food at its best. Whereas I, th I think that there's no sense there that it would be better if you turned the, if you're, if you think of something like a tomato, basil and mozzarella salad, there would be no idea in Italy that that would be better if you turned the mozzarella into a foam. <laughs> Whereas really, um, you know, but actually there are countries that think that's a worthwhile thing to be doing their food. I was at some very highly rated restaurant once in London and someone had turned the ricotta into a kind of freeze-dried powder. Why, you know? Why? Just because you can. Um, and it almost seems something a bit morally wrong in doing that with some beautiful ricotta. I think that sort of cooking is about the ego of a chef. And it's, it's thinking, I mean, it's thinking, what can I do to impose myself on that ingredient to make it interesting or different? And I don't know why you have to do that. That in a way, when, uh, when I was at university, one of the things I studied was the Russian formalists. And um, I remember reading a line that they said the point of literature, I was doing modern literary theory, the point of literature was to make the stone stonier. Now, that's not a good concept when you think of food, but what I think of Italian uh, cooking is they want you to taste the olive oil even more. They want you to taste that tomato more. They want you to taste the mozzarella, not just the taste of it, but get the texture at exactly the right temperature. And it's very simple. And they're not trying to show you what it could become if it were just distorted a bit. I mean, I have been to one Italian restaurant like that once, and it was a huge shock. Um, but generally speaking, I think that's a sort of cooking that feels so welcoming to the person who's eating it, because there's something about those restaurants, when I was a young and I was a restaurant critic for a while, that the, the plates come in, and um, there's this big silver cloche, and they lift it up, and it's meant to be this hallowed moment of reverence. And you feel quite uncomfortable, and you just look at you look at the food, and everything seems to be in small bits and arranged on a plate. It could be anything, and sometimes it tastes wonderful. And then I will change my opinion because one should always. And some people are geniuses, and they should be allowed to do whatever they want. But generally speaking, it's uh, it it, just, it takes things away from food. And I think it takes an awful lot of confidence to leave things alone. You do need to have great ingredients, so, yeah. You do, but you can do other things as well. I mean, um, my mother Kate, cooked from a time when you cooking was thought to be, you, well, maybe it wasn't that good, and you just, you know, put a lot of butter on it and then <laughs> roast it a long time. That works. But you do, but you see, what I always say to people in cooking is that you need, there are, there are two main ingredients. There's time and there's money. And if you haven't got much money, then you must be prepared to spend time. And cheap cuts of meat, which, if, you know, they don't have to be, um, you know, the, the, if, you, if you were to cook them quickly, they would be rough and, and tough and stringy and inedible. But you could, like lamb breast, you know, like ribs that I do, lamb ribs, you cook them for a long time and, they're, and, they, and they melt and they're wonderful. Um, and there are lots of uh, cuts of meat that, that need to be cooked for a long time. Now, if you haven't got a lot of time or you've got a lot of money, fine. You know, you can have a fillet steak. Now, actually, the flavor is going to be better in the cheaper cuts that you're going to cook for a long time. But yes, you can get incredible ingredients that you need to do nothing to. But 
but that doesn't but but in a way and of course if they're good quality they will taste good but even something you know soup can be made wonderful just by putting in enough wonderful vegetables they don't they don't have to be those ones that you've sort of picked at dawn i mean i'm afraid to say i do i mondays for me at home is when I go through everything and I think, well, that's maybe it's seen better days. I'm going to do something with it now because I don't like waste. I'm like, this is something that someone I revere a lot, Anna Del Conte, an Italian food writer, and she said once about Italians and food that they're extravagant but never wasteful, and I, re I recognized myself in that statement. I spend far too much on food, but I will never waste it. And there's always something you can do with the sort of food that other people would think, oh, you should throw it away. You freeze a lot of stuff, don't you? And I don't freeze as much anymore because I have a much smaller freezer because I'm, um, I'm trying to impose discipline because some on myself um, but I do things like for example when you for the cauliflower um, so many people just cook the florets whereas the, the you know those stalky um, the stalky bits steamed and then with really good olive oil on and, and white pepper are delicious oh, I've never I throw them away so no. okay. and also you know they flavor stock you know, so it's all those things. I mean, I am a bit, I'm very old fashioned in that way, you know, so that I will, if I'm making a stock um, or a soup, I will, even, so if I don't, even if I don't have a carcass, I will put the, you know, carrot peelings and the end bits of leeks and various other bits and the peelings. And I use, um, you know, the, the skins of onions and everything. I just will make a, stock, a vegetable stock with, with all that stuff. And, and you're not snobby about stuff, are you? Like, I know that Nigel Slater called you the queen of the frozen pea. Oh, no, I'm a great believer in the frozen pea. And also, I have made many a delicious ice cream with condensed milk, which is not like the most rarefied ingredient you'll ever come across. No, I hate food snobbery. I hate food snobbery. And I, then I think, well, what that... You know, Bertrand Russell said there's no sincerer... Is it Bertrand Russell or George Bernard Shaw? I can never remember. Um... I think it was Bertrand Russell, there is no sincerer love than the love of food. And I think that if you start trying to pretend you like things because you think that's fashionable, or you, or you, or you won't own up to liking something because you think people will judge you, I, I really don't, I don't understand that. I wondered how you'd got into your food career, because you started out as a journalist, you were the deputy literary editor on the Sunday Times, you were doing book reviews, and writing features. So how did How to Eat come about? Um, because I was, always, I was always mouthing off about food and whatever, why are they doing that? Because it was about, I suppose in the 90s, I would say things, you know how sometimes you go to restaurants and you think, I, it have, has the chef done this for a dare? Why else would you put these ingredients together? And so I used to spend a lot of time saying uh, to my husband, John, um, oh, look, it's, why, why have they put, you know, sage here? It would be, it'd be so much better if there's a bit of nutmeg or whatever it might be. And this is wrong. And why this is, this is too much of this sauce. And, and he said, hey, you're so confident in your opinions about food and people aren't. And maybe you should write, write a book about, you know, what you think about food and everything, call it how to eat. I said, I'm not going to do that. What an idiotic idea. Um, but then I did. And I didn't know that it was going to have recipes. I didn't know how it was going to be. And it just sort of took a... I spent many, many years not writing it. And then I wrote it. And then, and, and then putting it off and for one reason or another. And then I did it. So what inspired those recipes? How was the process of writing? Um, I think a lot of it was because my mother died very young. Um, at 48, and my, one of my sisters died even younger, uh, at 31. And um, one of our, the things that had always, I suppose, kept, I wouldn't say kept us together, but we used to talk about, we'd always say, if you, we phoned each other up, um, what are you cooking tonight? Uh, what are you eating? And I felt... I wanted that conversation to continue. It took me a while after they died, because you can't, you know, you're too raw. Um, and I th also felt, I think, 
that I needed to memorialize them. And the only way I could do that was, for me, was through their food. And so a lot of how to eat is the food I'd eaten growing up, the food I'd cooked with my sister when we were grown up, and what we thought about food. And it was really actually just um, everything... It was really the story of everything I'd eaten in my life up till then, and I was 38 when the book came out, and so I'd eaten quite a lot. <laughs> it's got a really strong narrative, hasn't it? Yes, yeah, so all my books are very much to do with where I am in my life, so How to Eat has got a whole chapter, for example, on very, very slightly smug, self-important, bossy chapter on weaning and feeding babies and toddlers. Um, but it's all the things I made for my children when they were just going on to solid food and things like that. And then, so each of my books has got various things that I've cooked at home for them or things they've then been able to cook or whatever. Um, and I think, so I don't really decide ahead of time. And I suppose it was at that stage a very, an odd thing to do to have what was a, a book about food, but suddenly going into that. But I was interested in what things you fed um, children. And in the same way, when I did Feast, which its subtitle was Food That Celebrates Life, which had all sorts of different religious festivals, but also, um, you know, an idea about oh, how we use food to, to denote that, 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 that something's important to us as human beings. But I also had a chapter on funeral food, because it seems to me that food also plays a very important part in... Um, in both at funerals, but in um, in mourning, and that in a sense of how we pull together the pieces of a life, and either give food to people who are uh, grieving, or find a way to eat and sort of uh, accept that you're that that you're alive and to be grateful for it. So I so I for me I don't like to cordon things off into enormously into into themes, but I, I, I kind of want to bring everything I experience in life, which for me is often ex expressed through food. So your life is kind of the foundation of the book, in a way. Yes, mm -hmm. I think so. I don't know. I don't know how else. I don't know how else I could would write a book. I ha I have done. I mean, I suppose I I did. Um, you know, I had a sort of theme book once with Italian-inspired food, but that was an awful lot about being in Italy. And the same went when I did Express, which was fast, you know, food that was pretty quick. That was also because I was needing to cook in that way at that time. So I suppose it's even everything does come out of my life. That's why I never really know what I'm going to do next. <laughs> Was it hard to write? Did you write it quickly or slowly? Or? Well, as I said, I put, it, put off writing, and then I had to spend ages on the recipes because I had never really weighed or measured anything before for how to eat. I mean, now I'm more used to it, but I still, it's a, it's a discipline. Um, but, uh, and then I was so behind. I, I mean, it, I actually just, I think I, I, uh, I wrote it in six weeks, and I have to tell you, the manuscript was twice as long. My record was 28,000 words in one day. You must have given off steam when you were doing I did, that. and I practically didn't see my children for six weeks, I have to say. Rather than, I had to sort of more or less, um, you know, say, hello, I'm your mother, at the end of each day. Um, <laughs> although I did, I'm a great believer in having children lying on the floor while I write, but they were a bit young for that then. I kind of went back and had a read of that book, which I bought 20 years ago when it came out. And you write so beautifully, and it made me wonder why you haven't done things other than food books, why you haven't written fiction, for instance. And has that ever been something that you've It was to something do? I very much wanted to do before I wrote How to Eat, and then I felt I'd found my voice. I think in a, in a way, you'll, you'll be able to tell me whether you feel this is true, since you're a novelist, that... When you write fiction, you've got nothing to hide behind. Oh, no, I think you've got everything to hide behind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I feel that... Your characters and your story and... Yes, but you're sort of in them. Whereas even though I'm being direct about myself when I write about food, there's a, there's a structure. The food sort of tells the story itself, or I'm telling the story of the food as it unfolds with me. I'm not left alone somewhere. Um having to, to create order where there is chaos. And um, 
I feel that I don't know that I'm very good at creating order. I think I'm better with chaos. <laughs> So now, you know, you've written, this is the 11th cookbook, mm. isn't it? What's the, what inspires you? What's the process like now? How do you, how do you well, start? Well, it's quite similar. Well, I don't know, but I always feel, when I finish a book, I think, I, I, that's, my, that's my last book. Do you? Yep, always. I won't ever, ever do a deal for another book, because I feel I never have an idea. And then I suppose what happens is, is that um, the discipline of doing a book and lots of weighing and measuring and things like that means that when I stop and when I'm, for example, I'll be back home in the kitchen, I suddenly feel I can cook in quite a free way and then I start getting interested in a particular thing or the recipes come, you know, uh, seem to just come up. I mean, I do have a, a couple of ideas that have been on the back burner probably for over 10 years and every now and then one of them seems, one of them's maybe coming uh, near me, but it would, it, it would need a bit of research, which I like. Um, but I don't know, I kind of, I, I let things just crawl to the front of my consciousness. I let it sort of carry on. I'm not very good at deciding. You know when people say, when they write novels, oh, the characters just, they, the characters seem to write themselves, which I was, can't believe. Um, but nevertheless, I, I do feel my books don't write themselves at all, but they, they insist on being written. And so I don't know which one will. So you don't, you're not out there looking for an ideas for new recipes? No. They sort of... No, but I'm, as I say, because I'm, I'm greedy, I always think about what I could cook. This, does this still... I feel like it's going quieter, but um, no, so I, that's, that's it. Um, gosh, lots of, I think that I often have certain things, I, I note down things I want to cook or I want to try quite often, and then I look at all my notes that, of what I want to try, and then I see you know, wh what, what I actually will cook. One of the great things is, um, I often make the great plans to cook something and then it gets, I look at it and it's so complicated, I think, I just can't. And I always think that's a great, that's sort of rather saving. So I would never put a recipe in a book that was in any way too overwhelming because I just wouldn't get past that hurdle myself. That's a really good rule of thumb though, isn't it? If it's too, if you can't be bothered cooking it, then. Well also I just feel, if I feel daunted by the shopping list, oh, that it's, you know, and I do find that difficult. I, I always found, particularly when my children were younger, but I always found that shopping is actually often the harder time to find everything that is harder than the cooking time. But I, so I do, but I do also like finding unusual ingredients and using them. So just so I don't, I don't want to go out shopping for an ingredient I use once. So when I do a book, I, if I send anyone out, including myself, to buy a particular ingredient, there are always a few recipes that use it because there, you know, there are times I've done a recipe and I've had a book and I've been sent out to buy an ingredient and then it's in my cupboard unused, you know, for the next 10 years. And you don't like waste. I don't like waste. Um, so the book comes first and then the television? Oh, very much so. I, the book, I, I understand, I, I have an intuition I feel for myself for the shape of a book and how it will be. Um, and I pay attention to that. I mean, that, this book at my table hasn't got any chapters, anything. It just just, go, just flows. And then there's this recipe and that recipe, and it just go, that's how I saw it, and that's how I felt it should be. Now, obviously, television can't be, it has, it has to have more shape. And although I'm beginning, after all this time, to understand the grammar of television a bit more, it's not my first language. And um, I'm, I work very closely with the director, and we go through, and I will... I do a sort of show and tell about the recipes and you know he decide and then I say this one would work or this is okay and it's about which process will suit TV it's you've got to be a bit more um, I, I suppose the pace in many ways has to vary more for each television episode whereas if you're reading a book and there's a chicken recipe you're quite you don't mind reading another chicken recipe on the next page whereas if you're watching a TV program you might want something different since you appeared on TV, there has been an enormous amount of focus on your appearance. And I'm going to read this piece that the Daily Mail ran, because it made me no, laugh. No, you should never write, read out no, anything honestly, that No, but honestly, it made me laugh, but it, 
it also made me cry a little bit, and it's about it's it's a description of your arrival at a TV studio in Melbourne, I think probably last week. The cookbook author. How do they know? Slipped her enviably spelt frame into a sophisticated blue midi dress. It might be that dress. As she made a radiant arrival at the Channel 10 studios in Melbourne. And then further on it says, the mother of two stunned in a form-fitting blue dress which clung to her slim waist and skimmed her womanly curves to its demure <laughs> knee-length hem. Now, no, Jamie Oliver never radiantly arrives everywhere, anywhere. No. No one talks about Gordon Ramsay's super spell figure. What is going on here, and how do you feel about it? Well, there is, look, women always get, their appearance is always talked about, our appearance is always talked about in a different way. And we are, I, I, I feel it's difficult, because television is a visual medium, and you do end up getting taught like, about it in all sorts of ways that you don't intend, but you don't have any control over it. And I feel, well... You know, it is, you do exist in, 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 a, in a physical form, which is why when I was a younger journalist, I don't know why I had to wait till I was 40 to go on television and 50 before I did high, high definition, but still, um, <laughs> that uh, when I was a younger journalist, I, I just agree, I did print or radio because I didn't like that focus, whereas now I can ignore it more. When you get older, you can ignore an awful lot, actually. That's one of the great things. So that, so that gender of course disconnect it, doesn't... You see what it, yes, does it please me? No, it does not. But um, I also think that we are... I think how it's moving is that it's just going to encompass uh, male as well as female. I don't think we're going to get rid of it. Do you think so? Yep. Yeah. Um, but generally speaking, I, it, you, I don't know what you all think, but to me that sounds terribly old-fashioned. You know, so that even though it still carries on, there's something that you feel like, gosh, someone who is, someone has actually written that now, and they, maybe they've done, maybe there's someone with a sense of humor there who is doing it as an ironic exercise, but it is very... It is extraordinary because it is an odd way to talk about people. And it's, um, I think it's this notion that, I don't know that, I don't know what, what's implied with all that, but I do think it's that, it's that when it's the, it's saying about, uh, when they say about women, don't they often, flaunting her curves, that just means, you know, walking across a room. <laughs> or, you know, flashing her legs, you know. I don't know, because it, it's, it is odd, and so I suppose that it is a sort of thing which is um, insistently sexualizing women. Now, what I think, I, I don't know, but if, that, if the writer of that, the fact that the writer is probably not terribly old, but nevertheless it's very old-fashioned, but what would, I, but you see, what if the writer's a woman? Because that's a very odd... It's a very odd way, I'm not saying that women can't find women sexual, but it's that sort of little lady type of writing I find odd. Um, but you're not just out for a walk, you're showing off your super spell. Yeah. Yes, I mean, also, I mean, look, I've, and also, if I'm always told, and all women are told this, I'm, I'm either told that I'm too thin or too fat. That's the thing. So, I have to say, but I don't... I, I really, and this maybe is something as you get older, I don't really find I care as much about what people think. <laughs> because in How to Eat, you did have a low-fat section. Mm, I did. And you're quite funny in that. You write, you know, just go on a diet, just don't talk about it. Don't say, <laughs> you, don't talk about being fat. People will just notice. You know? yeah. <laughs> and so I feel that it's ironic that in the subsequent 20 years, people have done nothing but talk about mm. it. And you haven't been allowed to kind of just be... Well, whatever. yes, but that's just journalists you're talking about, because I feel... Um, I, I think it's probably true of men too, but I notice it particularly with women and my friends and the women I meet at you know, book signings, that, is that we kind of go up and down with weight, and we understand that, and it is... 
just sort of normal. It's not always a big deal. And I think that sometimes, um, so, in, so in terms of whether, you know, some things are made of more of a big deal because it's in a newspaper or a television program, but I, don't, I think people are always quite sensible and they make up their own minds about things. They don't, they're not really told what to think. We are living in the era of the food fad. I mean, I've got friends, every time you have them for dinner, they've got some new eating plan that they're on, and it's um, quite exhausting. And you seem to really walk your own line and ignore all that. Is that on purpose? Or? Well, no, because that's because I'm like that. However, you see, I, I'm not as censorious as everyone else, because sometimes I find, as a cook, I find it quite um, helpful when, I'm, when people don't eat certain things, because I think... I have to think it's like painting a pa painting something with a different palette. I now have to think how can I make this taste good and without putting it in. I wouldn't want to do it every day of my life or too many I won't accept too many competing diets around one table. Um, <laughs> but if I'm just doing, you know, one or two, I don't mind. So for example, you know, I, although I've always cooked from, you know, long before people were did no gluten. I've done gluten-free cakes because I like cakes made with ground almonds. Um, nevertheless, because a lot of people who, you know, a lot of my friends, they come and they don't want, they say they don't want to eat gluten. I've actually made a lot of cakes I'm very happy with that I never would have made um, otherwise. So I'm very, very grateful. And also, although everyone said, a lot of people say, oh, what nonsense. My feeling is that, in a way, if someone doesn't want to, then they're coming to my house. I want to make something they'll like. Um, I mean, occasionally I feel, uh, I don't, I mean, the other day someone asked me, said, why hadn't I done sugar-free cakes? Sugar -free, and I said, I think if you want sugar-free, you better just not have, don't have a cake. I don't understand. <laughs> um, and she got quite cross with me. And then, I mean, but the point is, is that there's this view, which is wrong, that it's only refined white sugar that's sugar. If you, have some, if you have honey, it's not sugar. Whereas anything that's sweet, if you have dates, I mean, they're better for you than just white sugar, but even if you have dates, it's sugar. And I'd, so I'd, I, that's what I don't understand more, this thing of wanting um, food that pretends to be something and isn't quite. And you see, I'm very, I don't eat cakes very often, but when I have a cake, I want a, I want a nice cake. And you know, that, that in a way, mostly, I, I do a cake if people are coming for supper or for Sunday lunch or coming at the weekend. But, but what I find quite odd is a lot of people who don't want all that see nothing wrong in having a muffin with a cup of coffee every morning um, at a coffee shop. That kind that, of, and that's, so to me, that's all illogical. They're kind of denying themselves the pleasure of the really lovely thing that you've made for them. I know, but I, th I think a lot of people, um, it's, it's a very sad thing to say, uh, are more practiced and uh, at persecuting themselves than at finding pleasure in life. And that's terrible. So do you, you think... <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> you believe... <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> because you do... <laughs> thank you. Because you... You do believe in the importance of pleasure, don't you? I do believe in the importance of pleasure, but I think that can be... Uh, but you see, I don't have that hierarchy. So I don't think that... Um, I take as much pleasure from having a big bowl of greens that I do from having, um, I don't know, like a beautiful chocolate mousse. I don't... 
that's what I think. So it's not all about oh, forget everything. Is that is that all food is pleasurable? And I think that it's that I, you know it's so strange. I think I wrote about this in How to Eat, which is as you say, 20 years ago. Which is why people demonise some foods and venerate others. And actually, you know, all food um, is there to be enjoyed. And I, and I think it's. I think for a lot of people, I understand when people don't feel safe about things, they don't know what they should be. You know, you read things all the time, this is good for you, no, that's good for you, that's bad for you, no, don't eat that. And I, I think it makes people so anxious before they start eating. Whereas actually, if you eat in a balanced way and enjoy everything, I, I think you're, that you're not going to have you know, overdo any particular thing and that's the thing is that it, make, it makes people so particularly unbalanced and there's a book out um, recently called Orthorexia and it's about people who for whom healthy eating becomes um, an illness um, and bec because there's so much anxiety about what they should be eating and so so many different foodstuffs are taken out of their daily diet that they actually um, uh, don't are not having the nutrients they need because I love um, you know as I said I love broccoli I love all that I'm I am um, I was just talking to someone earlier today saying that I once went to um, a nutritionist I can't remember why I think someone said go I was I, used to, I was having quite bad stomach aches and I, when I talked about what I ate she said you're the first person who's ever come to see me that I've told to eat fewer vegetables. Because she couldn't believe I was eating so many. No wonder I was giving myself tummy ache. But so the point is, though, is that they are very good, but you're not meant to have so much and not a little bit of everything else. I'm not, I'm not saying you can't be vegetarian or vegan. You can be if you do pay attention to your diet and make sure you're putting in enough that will you know, give you everything you need. But I, I do think some people are uh, using so-called healthy eating as a way of, of, of eating too little. And controlling life maybe a little bit. Yes, but we all do that one way or another. I mean, I think there's something quite, when you cook, you're trying to impose a teeny bit of order into the randomness of life. But certainly, yes, you're, it's certainly right. That, and I think that it, you know, the, the more control you have on life, the more frightening it becomes. Now, we started a little bit late, so I'm kind of running a little bit late here, but we are going to move to questions soon. So, like Rachel said, there's microphones up at the front and you have to kind of come down. And um, um, please make sure it is a question and not just something that you're saying, otherwise I'll get angry and you don't want that. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to ask Nigella one more question. I've got so many questions, I feel like we haven't even scratched the surface. Um, I know what I'm going to ask you. You've just appeared on MasterChef in Australia, and I find those programs incredibly stressful to watch and daunting, and I wondered how you felt about those competitive mm. cooking shows. Well, I have to say, I actually love doing um, MasterChef in Australia because I find it quite a kind program, and not like that. Although I have to say, I do get quite stressed uh, when I'm there, and I just think, oh, no, they're not going to finish, or are they going to finish? So it is a bit stressful, but it's not, you know, I don't find it stressful like watching, um, you, know, uh, you know, a Scandinavian, you know, murder series. <laughs> um, but, so I, I very, I, I think I'm very happy with those sorts of programs provided the emphasis is on the food, and it's constructive and kind and uh, inspirational, but what I'm not mad keen on are the ones when people are made to feel bad or shouted at. I don't like cruelty and I don't like unkindness and I don't like bad manners. <laughs> I'm very old fashioned. Right. So I always say to my rule with children is my rule with children is I always used to say you can be naughty but you can't be rude. <laughs> Did it work? Mm. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's anyone who's got a question, if they want to make their way to one of the microphones at the front, I can't even see them from here, but, oh, look, there's one up there. I can see that. Is there anybody? Yes, I can see one there. I can see uh, people oh, moving. I can see quite a few. Slowly moving down. 
I think I was, there was an order. They're very, they're, they're not really rushing to the microphones, are they? <laughs> Just climb yes, there's over someone the there. people. There's someone there on your right. Over there, all right. So can we go to this lady on the right? Is the microphone working? Oh, it's not. <laughs> Sound man. What? I think that. Apparently, you've got to get closer to it. I don't think it's working. Hello. Where's Rachel? Hello. 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 Is this working? Hello. Hello. Hello, Nigella. Can you hear me? Okay, Hello. there's someone up there oh. to the left. Yep. Hi. Can we hear you? Yes. You can hear me. Hello, Nigella. Massive fan. My name's Miranda. Um, I'm up here to your right. All right. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Nigella, you've been in the public eye for a lot of your life. Um, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. Um, um, what you've put out there and then what has been sought from you. What do you do apart from cooking to give back to yourself, to find your own centre in this world? And what do I do apart from cooking? Just to fit to... Well, um, I love... Um, I like talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just strange. Sometimes I need silence. I read a lot. Yes. I need a lot of time on my own for reading. Um, and so that matters. And I like, and I like um, walking. No, I'm not... Often I don't do as much walking as I should. <laughs> and when I do, I feel much better for it. But I, I do... I think reading is one of the great... Uh, solaces in life and well solace makes it sound like it's making up for something and I don't necessarily think that but um, there's wonderful lifelong companionship to be got from uh, reading and I like that I like the firing of the imagination and that feeling of uh, being with characters you I, I, you enjoy being with or even if they irritate you but I think there's something that, that, that I do feel um, it's very necessary, it's, it's, it's almost, I mean, food we need to survive, but for me, there's a certain sort of feeding I get, I think, from, re from reading books. So is it, is it fiction that you read then? Sorry. Sorry. Is it fiction that you enjoy reading? You talk about the characters? I couldn't hear that. Is it, fiction? Is it fiction? Is it fiction? Yeah. I do read, yes, mostly I read fiction, but I also... Um, I, I enjoy uh, memoir as well, actually, but I do, yeah, I do, and I read, I read an awful lot, and sometimes I read such a lot that everything um, becomes blurred into one great big novel, and I can't remember which novel the characters are in. <laughs> um. Right, I'm a, bit I'm a bit nervous of the microphones. The um, I'm, Hello, I'm down can the you hear me? Here on the left-hand side. Hello? Ooh, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I'm up here. Hi. <laughs> um, Nigella, if you could have a dinner party and invite six people, living or dead, who would you have? Um, you know, I also say this, but I feel that dead people would be very poor company. <laughs> um, do you know what? I just think I would be... Re there are a lot of people I admire, but I, there is... I, at no time would I want to... I think I'd feel very odd inviting people I don't know to my house. And really, I just always want um, just that network of my close friends and family. Um, you know, d different parts of my family, depending on how everything is going. Um, but, but I don't have... I don't know that... I think if I were to invite various people I admire, it would make me feel too nervous when I, when I was cooking and that, I'd, I'd, uh, that I couldn't do. Then it would become, a bit, I suppose I'd feel a bit like having a restaurant, which I couldn't do. So I'm afraid I'm just boring. I just like the people I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to have your friends over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have we Hi, got Nigella, another I'm question? down here on the left-hand side. Just down the bottom here. Left-hand left side. <laughs> Hi. <Thank you> much. <laughs> Hi there. Um, I just find that often when I'm cooking dinner in the evenings, I end up cooking the same thing all the time, or I just have sort of a, a, a really small repertoire of stuff to cook. I'm just wondering how you kind of get inspiration for cooking new stuff and get out of habits. Okay. And, do you know what? Everyone's got quite a small repertoire. Even if they cook from a large repertoire, they, we do tend to repeat things quite a bit. I have to be very strict with myself <clears throat> because I 
not to keep repeating the same things. Um, there are certain recipes in this book that I have to say, right, you're not allowed to cook them now. You've got to, not for another two months. Um, so I think that you, what you have, to, you have to, if you're going to add, do, are you talking about everyday life or are you talking about when people come over? Uh, just everyday life, really. Everyday life. Yeah. Well, I think with everyday life, you might have to do what my, you know, what used to be done. My grandmother always had, you, um, she had like a schedule. She knew in advance what she was going to, you knew what day of the week it was, depending when you were there. And we all thought, we thought, oh, that, how restrictive, we're going to do so many different things. But the point is, she had seven different suppers a week. And I'm afraid to say, I spent a long time giving my children pasta, you know, an awful lot. So you think it's, this is restrictive because you're repeating it. But actually, you'd be surprised if you did yourself a timetable. Go, go back to the past, give yourself a timetable also very good for everything because you can plan to use the leftovers from certain things and actually just then you you know what you're going to do you're not sitting every day thinking what am I going to cook or what am I going to cook tomorrow you've got it all planned out and I think actually they did that for a particular reason it made sense from a budgetary point of view and it didn't it made them it made everything you know, decided in advance, it's just much easier. And then you can, but what you can do, which my grandmother never did, is that after a while you can change those, <laughs> you can change, uh, you know, the, the weekly, the weekly order and have another one for a, a month or so. Okay. Thank you very much. My pleasure. This lady here. Hi, Nigella, how are you? Hi, I'm Hey, um, my name's Lily and I'm a um, caterer in North Canterbury. Um, random question, and I'm totally for let's see at the moment. I was wondering, tomorrow morning, would you like to come and have breakfast with me? Ah, <laughs> uh, that's, that's very nice, but, um, and that's very nice, but I'm actually um, leaving for the airport at something mad like four in the morning. Oh, oh. No. I'll be back, I'll come yeah. as, I'll come as the Terminator said. No worries, thanks. <laughs> I think we've got some time for some more questions. So is there another lady at that microphone yet? Hi, Nigella. Hello. I just wanted to know, on Sunday afternoons is my cooking time, cooking and baking for the week, and I like to listen to music, and I just wondered if you listen to music when you cook or bake, and what you listen to. Do you know, I very rarely listen to music when I cook. I love the sound that food makes. I get a great deal of pleasure from that, and I also feel, but you're young, I can see from there in the shadows, <laughs> and I'm gonna say something that sounds, which is I find the world a very noisy place, and everywhere you go, they play music. And I sometimes, um, and I feel I'm always surrounded by a lot of noise and then I can't get over the bliss of some peace and quiet. <laughs> um, so I, I don't mind the radio sometimes and listening to a program. So I might listen to something like Desert Island Discs on the radio and then there'll be a teeny bit of music. But mostly, even though I do sometimes, but when I, you see, for me, when I really want to listen to music, I want to dance. But when I cook, I'm very happy just, you know, hearing the music of the food itself. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but there is something about, you know, when the sizzle of onions or bacon and, you, 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 you know, food often makes a slightly different sound as it gets cooked. And I like all that. But you see, that's, I suppose it goes to bit is that for me, getting as much pleasure as you can out of everything includes that. And I feel that maybe I've not you know, it's, if I'm going to listen to music, I find it quite difficult then to concentrate on something else. I don't like background music. And it's, I guess, just part, it's quite meditative then, cooking mm. for you. It is. Yeah. Well, it is, although, you know, I don't, you know, I'm, I keep making a vow I'm going to do meditation and so far cooking is about as far as I've got. <laughs> I have tried, actually. I did try. I had got an app. And I did, um, did do it for a bit. And I know it's meant to be really good for you, and I really believe the science, but I'm, haven't, I haven't stuck to it. <laughs> Should we try one more microphone? You choose. No, I don't do the choosing. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's so Makes unfair. me feel mean. Um, you can be there's the mean some people one. up here. I wonder if your one will work. Will this one work down here? Oh, that one's Downstairs. working. Yeah. Hello. Go on, then you go. Hi, Nigella. Nice to speak Hi. with you. Um, I'm just wondering about on your 
quiet, cozy night in where you're just cooking for yourself and perhaps watching something on telly, what might you cook and what might you watch? Right, what might I cook? Well, what I watch it would be... Um, believe it or not, I'm a bit of a Game of Thrones person. <laughs> took me a long time, but then I do that. Um, and... Um, I don't know. I mean, it's I, what I might cook. Is, it so it depends. I'm quite keen on a, uh, or, you know, I'm, I love a big bowl of noodles. I like things I can slurp out of a big bowl. Um, uh, I also, well, it's, you know, it, I feel that I, I'm not. Re I don't really have one particular thing I cook. Although I do sometimes. There's a sauce. Well, it's a sort of salsa dippy thing I make. It's in the book. It's called green sauce at home. But in the book, it's called. Um, jalapeno and I don't, coriander salsa and I just blitz together coriander, uh, lime juice, bit of lime zest, salt, garlic, oil, I think that's it, and, the, and green uh, chilies and we do do that sometimes I have to say I can lie with the children with a thing of that and some blue corn chips or some sugar snap peas dipping away for a long time. We have something called the food towel if we're watching television in bed. That we so that the towels. My sister invented this, so you put a towel so it doesn't, you don't make everything filthy. But um, <laughs> but you see, I'm not really mad keen on eating and watching television at the same time for the same reason as I don't like doing music and cooking, which is I like to sit down at a table and really enjoy my food. And I feel that I can't, I'm not very good. I mean, I can do, as I say, I can dip things in a, salt, in a salsa, but otherwise I prefer to sit down with a knife and fork and a plate and everything. So do you still sit at a table? Yes, but I, sit, I do sit at the table, but every now and then. So the sort of thing I will do is if, you know, I will do, because I sometimes get, like normal people, I get takeaway sometimes as well. So if there's a good, there's a good pizza place near us, so sometimes we will do... You know, we'll watch television with the towel down and some very good pizza. And I then, I take up, and I take up the condiments upstairs. And so there's, you know, Tabasco and chili, some chili pepper flakes and some good olive oil, some extra salt and that sort of thing. And so there's lots of passing and pouring and that sort of thing. So I can do that because I don't, but I, as a, I wouldn't, nor, I don't, I certainly don't feel like, I, I either need to be sitting at a table or lying down. I can't do sitting on a sofa eating. Thank you. <laughs> right, we're going to do, do standing one. up eating, which is not a very good habit. One last question, and then I think we're probably done. Is there another one? I don't know if there is, actually. Everybody's I think that one. person's been waiting. Okay, can you, can you be heard? Speak. Hello. Oh, yes. I think you might need to come nearer. You have to get very near these things. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I know you have a very large cookbook collection. I was just wondering how you manage and keep track of all your recipes. Do you index or how do you manage it? How I keep track of the recipes that I write? No, no, your actual cookbook collection. That oh, my you have. But I, listen, I don't keep track of anything. I don't keep track of my own recipes or other people's. <laughs> and every now and so I, I, I just don't. But that's what's so wonderful. In fact, a lot of my cookbooks are in store. But what I love is. Um, that thing of returning to a book I know and just lying on the sofa, but picking it out and looking again and being reminded of recipes I love and coming to them again. And I think that there was, a, I do tear things out of newspapers and magazines as well. Recently, I've just found, but I never look at them again once I've torn them out. So that's good. I also have got an app on my phone, which is great. So you can just get recipes from anywhere and it will log them and put them in and say where they're from I never look at it again as well <laughs> so I feel the thing is it's probably better not to not to keep them at all do you stick to recipes um I try and make myself always stick to a recipe the first time because I think you have to yeah but I but when I I'm always teased at home sometimes I'm going on one of my recipes and it says well she says to use um, three tablespoons of lemon, lemon juice, but I, I just don't want to. I'm going to, and um, Hetty, who works with me, says to me, you do realise you're talking about yourself, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, thank you so much for coming to New Zealand and coming to Christchurch to talk oh, to us tonight. It's my pleasure. 
Um, Nigella's going to be signing her books, including her new one at my table, and I think it's in the Gloucester Room. You guys probably all know where that is, but I believe it's somewhere up there. So um, I hope you all enjoy meeting her, and thank you very much. I've certainly enjoyed meeting you. And you can ask me whatever you, you know, any more questions, I'll be there. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.